the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, O Lord. Now when the Pharisees and some of the scribes who had come from Jerusalem gathered around Jesus, they noticed that some of his disciples were eating with defiled hands, that is, without washing them. For the Pharisees and the Jews do not eat unless they thoroughly wash their hands, thus observing the tradition of the elders. And they do not eat anything from the market unless they wash it. And there are also many other traditions that they observe, the washing of cups and pots and bronze kettles. So the Pharisees and the scribes asked him, why do your disciples not live according the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? He said to them, Isaiah prophesied rightly about you hypocrites, as it is written, the people who honors me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching human precepts as doctrines. You abandon the commandment of God and hold to human tradition. Then he called the crowd and said to them, listen to me, all of you, and understand. There is nothing outside a person that by going in can defile, but the things that come out are what defile. For it is from within, from the human heart, that evil intentions come. Fornication, theft, murder, adultery, avarice, wickedness, deceit, licentiousness, envy, slander, pride, folly. All these evil things come from within, and they defile a person. The Gospel of the Lord. The Pharisees are at it again, making accusations against Jesus and his disciples. That seems to be their mission, to scrutinize Jesus and his followers and to try to catch them in any violation of religious law. So they ask Jesus, why do your disciples not live according the tradition of the elders, but eat with defiled hands? The tradition was, when you come home from the market, you would ceremoniously wash your hands. So what does it mean to be defiled? Who are the people in our society, in our culture, who are seen as defiled? Have you ever been perceived as defiled? It's an ugly word, one that we don't use very often. But we use other words that mean pretty much the same thing and are just as bad. Many of our current culture wars have a basis in this word or words like it. When we see people as the other or as outside or as just not us, we judge them to be defiled. Immigrants, Muslims, members of the LGBTQIA plus community, they're often judged as defiled. Jesus, however, says that the judges have missed the truth about others, and they haven't even taken a good look at themselves. They look squeaky clean on the outside, but inside things are different. They miss both the bad things in themselves and the good things in others. The result is that they think they have life all figured out. They avoid the challenges they ought to face, and they use their religious power to lay unbearable burdens on others because of imagined flaws and made up laws. Whatever it is that they are seeing when they look at their lives and the lives of others, it certainly is not the truth. But what if we are the ones judging ourselves? Victims of abuse and sexual violence often don't come forward because they feel they must somehow be at fault. They believe they are defiled. Young people wondering about their sexuality or their gender identity hide what they feel <coughs> because they've been taught that what they feel is wrong. They believe they are defiled. People who are bullied often internalize the taunts of those who harass them. They believe that they are defiled. So where can we turn to look 
to see the truth about ourselves? And do we have the courage when we do this not to shy away from what we see? James says we need to look into the perfect law of liberty. If we want to see things how they really are, and what is the perfect law? The law which sets us free. It's love. The Bible tells us that love is the fulfilling of the law. Learning that we are loved by God and letting that love spill out to others, not just in words, but in what we do, will give us a clear sight of ourselves and clear sight of our world and those around us because we'll be learning to see the world as God sees the world. If the Pharisees had looked at the world and at themselves through the light of love, rather than through that narrow prism of rules and regulations, if love had been their priority, their lives would have been very different. There they were, anxiously striving all the time, working hard to be worthy. But what if they could have seen themselves just as they are in God's eyes? They would already have known that they were worthy and precious, that God loved them. What a liberating thing this can be. What a joy there is in these, what joy for the joyless life, the perfect law, the law of liberty, the law of love, which sets us free. Imagine for a moment that you could look into the eyes of God and that you could see yourself reflected there. You'd have to get pretty close to see your own reflection, very close up. You'd have to linger a while and sort of focus on God's eyes. And what happens when you look into the eyes of someone who loves you? You see not only your own reflection, but also their love for you. Looking at ourselves reflected in God's eyes, we see ourselves as we are. Yes, we would see that we are flawed and we have a whole lot to learn and a lot of things to need to go out in the world and do, but we would also see God's endless love for us. Coming close to God, lingering in God's presence, looking into their eyes reminds us that we are not condemned for our faults. Lingering with God, we hear the challenges, but we hear them spoken with love. God will not reject us, no matter what we do or who we are. God's love is unconditional. Perhaps ours should be too. Amen. <laughs>